Here we are. Uh, welcome to everybody. Now we will have a very short interview with Professor Michael Sandel, who is Professor of Political Philosophy and the Theory of Government at Harvard University. The topic today is uh, eugenics and uh, human enhancement, and we are talking about the ethical arguments which uh, can be brought about, about this, this topic. Uh, Professor Sandel is famous for having elaborated a refined version of a position which is based on the notion of a common good. And the, sometimes this position is, has been labeled as communitarianism, but the, the idea is rather that in this perspective the relationship of justice with the idea of common good is uh, an intrinsic relationship and that there is uh, something which is important in the practice of living together. So I will put some questions okay. to Professor Sandel. The first question is this. Uh, your position about these issues is uh, carefully argued in your book The Case Against Perfection. And the ce a central role in your argument is assigned to the idea of life as a gift which exceeds our productive abilities. Reflecting upon this offers an argument for a more prudent and humble attitude concerning the possibility of improving human nature. Now, my question is, uh, how much is this a different position from the traditional position based on the sanctity of life principle? Right. I should say, first, the book we're now talking about is about bioethics against yeah. perfection, and it's an argument against the use of genetic engineering for the sake of non-medical enhancement, making children taller or stronger or smarter, as if that, uh, which is not yet possible, or choosing the sex of our children for non-medical reasons. And I'm a critic of that, not because I think it's wrong ever to intervene in nature, because I'm very much in favor of biomedical technologies which do intervene in nature for the sake of health, for the sake of curing disease or preventing disease. My argument is against using these technologies essentially for consumer purposes. We should not turn biomedicine into an extension of the consumer society to try to order up the genetic traits of our children, whether they be a boy or a girl, uh, tall rather than short, smart rather than less gifted, uh, or athletically fit. These, I think, are purely non-medical preferential choices that risk turning children into commodities mm -hmm. rather than affirming the unconditional love of parents for children. Okay, I see. So the idea is a kind of objection against a free market conception of life, more yes, or less. Yes, it is. It's, it's connected to a general hesitation I have about the extension of free market ideas into spheres of life, including moral and spiritual life, that are properly governed by non-market values. Okay, uh, so uh, could you expand this a little bit? What is your general objection to the liberal perspective, especially concerning the idea that, well, if we guarantee that there is no discrimination, that we have uh, fair institutions, there should be nothing wrong in improving uh, human life. What is your general objection to this? Well, I worry about the attitudes, the dispositions, the qualities of character that are encouraged and promoted if we become a society where parenting means designing the genetic characteristics of children. My worry is that it will corrupt the social practice of parenting, which is properly informed and traditionally informed by norms of acceptance, uh, which involves a certain humility, a willing to accept the unpredictable in one's child, rather than to turn children into really consumer objects and an extension of the consumer society. I see. Now, let me turn to uh, an even more general issue. Uh, you recently published uh, a book which is called Justice. It has been translated into Italian by Feltrinelli with the title Giustizia, where you present the different theories of justice, and you also develop a perspective which is based on the idea of, of the common good. Well, a, a part of the argument is the relationship between 
justice, a, a fair society, and the religi religious traditions. The liberal uh, uh, tradition usually uh, takes a stance of neutrality concerning religious traditions. Uh, in your sp perspective, which is more Aristotelian, which is uh, based on the idea of uh, common good and the idea of a uh, telos of different practices, uh, how can we uh, give the uh, um, the appropriate weight to religious traditions without the risk of conflict yes. between traditions. Right. Well, you've put it well. I am arguing against uh, liberal theories of justice and of rights that think it's possible to detach questions of justice and rights from considerations of the common good. I want to reconnect uh, the reasoning we engage in in the public sphere about justice and rights. I want to reconnect that kind of reasoning with questions of the common good uh, and questions about the purpose or the telos of social institutions. Now, to bring in questions, moral questions, or considerations of the good does mean that sometimes uh, religiously informed conceptions of the good will play a part in public discourse about justice. Some liberal theorists fear this conclusion they want justice and rights and public discourse to proceed in a way that is neutral with respect to competing accounts of the rights of citizens. I don't think it's possible, uh, and, and may not even be, de I think it's not possible or, or desirable, to detach public debate in democratic life from qu uh, questions of the good life and of virtue and of character. And if that means a receptivity to all moral and spiritual traditions, then I say democratic life should welcome the full range of moral and spiritual traditions that inform people's convictions about the meaning of the good life. I don't think that we will agree on either scenario. I don't think that the liberal conception of neutrality produces agreement, nor do I suggest that morally engaging competing conceptions of the good will bring agreement but democratic life is not mainly for the sake of agreement. It's learning how to disagree and to reason together uh, respectfully, listening to one another, engaging with moral convictions of citizens we may disagree with. That way of arguing by engaging rather than avoiding the moral arguments lying behind the policies uh, that all of us argue for, I think leads to a richer, better form of democratic life. So thank you very much, Professor Sandel. It was a very good interview. And this was uh, an interview with Professor Michael Sandel about the genetics and ethics. And this is on Moralia on the web. Uh, this is our third interview. And I hope that we will have new interviews in the future. So come back to us in the future. Bye-bye.